Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Bible study this week, where today we are going to be looking at the widow's offering from Mark 12, verses 41 to 44. And again, like in the previous videos, if there is a time when you want to take a moment and pause the video so you can read the text or contemplate a question, please feel free to do so as we move along, because I'll just be kind of cruising through the questions and, and giving my answers for them. And we'll begin, like always, with our psalm and prayer. So we'll read these here. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. And we begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, enable us to see how blessed we really are, that we may be content. Make us aware of how undeserving we are of your gracious gifts, that we may be grateful. And remind us of how faithfully you care for us, that we may trust in you. Fill us with your love, that we may willingly give ourselves and all we have into your service. Amen. So today, as we're going through this lesson, just to get into the mindset of it, it is the Tuesday of Holy Week when, when Jesus speaks this, this uh, story here. So it's the Tuesday of Holy Week, the last week of Jesus' life on earth. Jesus is teaching in the temple courtyards. And in our lesson today, we find him preaching a powerful two-sentence sermon that speaks volumes about God. So our first portion here is Jesus pays attention to our offerings. And since this portion of scripture is pretty short, I'll just read these for us here. From Mark 12, 41. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. So question one from this verse here. What was Jesus watching? Maybe kind of an obvious one, since it tells us plainly what he was doing. Jesus was watching people bringing their offerings to the temple, just observing, observing what was going on around him, saw the people bringing their gifts. Question two. Some people feel that talking about money in the church is a necessary evil. Maybe we've all had that thought at one point or another that it's, it's something that might make us a little uncomfortable because we don't necessarily like talking about finances, especially when it comes to the church. Uh, they believe that most people who attend church are turned off when a sermon deals with money and giving. Like I said, it, it can be kind of an awkward thing. They worry about the church getting the reputation of being interested only in money. What do you think about that? When you think of the times when we, when we talk about in our, in our worship about giving, what do you think? Is it something that's bad? Is it something that's good? What are your thoughts? Well, our attitudes toward and our use of money is just a part of life, and we want everything in our lives to glorify God. That's what, unfortunately, what a lot of our lives are based around. We we bring in money so that we can live, we can buy our food, and we can pay for our house and all that stuff. But we know in everything we do, we want it to glorify God, and that includes our money. And a lot of times, the, the, the phrase, uh, money is the root of all evil, comes out of people's mouths, when in reality, the verse says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, because money can be a huge blessing, especially for the church. Talking about money and how we use it to God's glory is something Christians like to do. When you have that cheerful giving attitude in your heart, it's, we want to talk about it and, and how we're using our money and our blessings to, to grow the church and to spread the gospel. That's always an amazing thing. So when dealt with properly with the cross at the center of the discussion, the topic of money and giving is not offensive. I think in some cases it definitely could be offensive if someone just says, we need more money to pay for this or that. But if we say, 
Look at what Jesus did on the cross for us. And everything that he did, does, how does that make you feel? It makes you feel thankful. It makes you feel so proud to be a believer in him. And that just, that just encourages us to give all the more. And when we stay connected to God's word, we see that faith working in our hearts and we see it also working when we, we give back to the church. Question three. Of the 38 parables spoken by Jesus, roughly a third of them deal with money and possessions. One out of every six verses of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in some way discusses the right use of money and material goods or what money can buy. Why did Jesus find it important to talk so much about money and how we use it? Well, money and how we use it can be a good thing or a bad thing. If you let money take that, that, that number one place in your life and in your heart, it can be a bad thing. But when we use it to give back to that number one place in our heart, talking about God, then it's a good thing. Our hearts are inclined to selfishness and materialism. And I think at some point or, or another in our lives, I think we can all finally admit that maybe we've had that moment. You see as kids, kids do that. The mine, 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 this is mine. And even as adults, we tend to, the money that we make is ours. And sometimes we have that little selfish attitude where we say, well, I want to spend it on something that I want to do, not just give it to something where I don't know where it's going. We need to recognize that we live in the light of the fact that God, not wealth, meets all of our needs. Uh, during the time of recording this video, we are going through the coronavirus pandemic that's happening in our lives. And a lot of people, unfortunately, are out of work, at least for a temporary time. And that really shows you where our needs are met. They aren't necessarily met with the money that we make, although our money does buy the things that we, that we need. But where does that all come from? It comes from God. So even in times when we are struggling, when things don't seem to be going well, God still provides. Some way or another, God still provides. Yeah, it might not be luxurious, and it might not be what we're used to or what we think we want, but it's, it's what God gives us, and it's, it's what we need to live in his glory and grace. Question four. Why does Jesus pay attention to the offerings God's people today give him? So when we, when we gather the offerings in church here, why, why does Jesus pay attention to that? Well, he wants to see our love reflected in what we give him. Because he does see. It, maybe it might seem like he doesn't because what do we do? We pass the plate around, or if people give online, they give online, and then we bring the plates up front. But that's the reason we bring the plates up front. It, it's not just a symbol to show that, oh, we're, that here's all the stuff that we gave. Let's just go set it up front so we all can look at it. No, it's because we're, where are we bringing it? We, we bring the offerings up front to the cross. We, we bring them up to our God, showing him this is what we can give you out of our cheerful hearts to give back to you out of our love and our thanks. And he sees that. He sees it and he knows in our hearts that we give out of a love and a thanks to him. Moving on to the next portion here, the widow's seemingly paltry offering or her really small insignificant offering. Reading from Mark 12, 41 to 42. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Part two, question one. There were 13 receptacles, which at the time were trumpet-shaped with the narrow ends up, placed in the temple. You can think of them as maybe like a vase, something like that, or a pot in, in what was called the courtyard of the women. So there was an outer courtyard of the temple where the women would gather, and then there would be kind of an inner courtyard, and that's where the men would go. And then, of course, you have the holy place and the most holy place 
where the priests would be. Verse 41 indicates that the wealthy repeatedly put large offerings into these receptacles, just coming by and putting their coins in. And then verse 42 introduces us to someone who didn't fit the pattern of the other givers. Describe this woman and her gift. Well, if we go back to the verse we just looked at, she was a widow and her gift was very small. And that's all we're told at first. So let's dive deeper. Let's look at question two. In a male-dominated culture, meaning back at the time when, when Jesus was speaking these words, how do you think, or when Jesus was looking at this, how do you think some widows, especially childless ones, fared? How do you think they fared? Well, widows without husbands had few rights, and sometimes no one to care for them, especially if they didn't have children. So today in our world, if someone is a widow or someone just isn't married, they're just a a single woman, you can still do really anything that you want. You can get a job and you can do all sorts of things. You have all the rights, really, that a man does. But back in Jesus' time, that wasn't the case. So if you didn't have a husband to go and buy things for you and make deals, and if you didn't have your children to work for you and you were unable to work, then it was especially hard for them to live. Question three. The Greek word describing this widow is translated poor in the translations we have today, but actually the word refers to a situation far worse than being poor. If you look at the word in the original language, it literally comes out to mean beggarly or destitute. And you can see kind of the big difference between those words. We think of poor, and that's a very broad word, right? When we think of poor, we think of, you know, maybe we have this certain mindset of like, you know, how much annual wage you make, but that's, it's a very large gap. But when you think of beggarly or destitute, that really puts them at the very bottom of the spectrum, right? They, they are destitute. They literally have almost nothing, So how do you think the middle class and wealthy worshipers in the temple regarded this woman and her offering? Well, they may have looked at her and her offering and concluded, why does she even bother? For example, if you think of it in today's terms, someone puts in $100 into the offering plate. That's a pretty substantial amount of money. It's a great gift. And what if someone came in and threw in a couple of pennies, maybe a nickel, a dime, a quarter. Our selfish hearts might look at that and say, "That's what's, what's the point of that? What's that going to do? That's not going to pay for anything. But it's, see, we talk about in this, in this story here of, in Mark, it's, it's not about what you give. It's the attitude of the giver. So we'll move on to the next portion, which is the widow's large gift, looking at it in a different way. From Mark 12, 43 and 44. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all, have out, they all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. So part three, question one. To the casual observer, the widow gave the smallest offering that day. Jesus told his disciples just the opposite. So how did Jesus describe what the woman did? Well, he told us that the others gave a part of their greater income. And and if we think about the people like the Pharisees and and what we see in a lot of parts of the Bible where they have a, a specific amount, the 10%. I tithe 10%, I give it back to the church. And that's what we see here. And that's most likely what they were doing. They just gave a part of their income. But the widow gave all she had to live on. Everything that she, everything that she had, every penny she had, literally, she gave back to her God. Question two. If those two coins where all this poor widow had to live on, why did she give them 
to the Lord. Why would she do that if she literally couldn't be able to pay for food? Why would she do that? Well, let's take a look at Psalm 146. And I'll read this here. Blessed are those whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. So to go back to the question, why did she give them to the Lord? Well, she recognized how much God had done for her and wanted to thank him. She trusted God's promise to take care of the widows and the orphans. Literally in verse 9, it says, The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. God promises to take care of those who love him and those who fear him. And he does. And she recognizes that. She believes that in her heart. So that's why she gave those coins. Question three. Explain this statement. Our giving to the Lord is essentially an act of faith. What would you think about that? Well, our giving is an act of faith. We trust that God will take care of us, especially when we give beyond our ability. It's also an act of faith in that we believe that God is good and loving and deserves our best. Because there is a lot of faith when we put money in the offering plate on Sundays. We understand that, yes, maybe this could be going to something else. Maybe I could go out to eat this month. Maybe I could do this with this money. But instead, I'm giving it to God. And maybe I won't see directly what this money is going to do for the church, but I know that God will provide for me and he will provide for his church. So it's completely done out of, out of faith. Question four. Our sinful nature does not trust God in the least. How does our sinful nature struggle against us as we seek to give to God in faith? Maybe think of this for yourself. How does your sinful nature struggle against you as you seek to give to God in faith? We are tempted to hedge in our giving, meaning we we are tempted to hold back what we give to the church. We wonder if what we give now might be money we will desperately need later. You know, might know the phrase, pennies for a rainy day. You, you want to store it. And, and in a certain extent, it is very important that we have stuff saved up as an emergency fund just in case of an emergency. But there's also something to be said about putting your trust in God and in giving what you can to the church. We are tempted to be selfish and to want to keep what is ours for ourselves. I think in one way or another, we all have that, that temptation inside of us. While we believe that it doesn't matter how much money we have, we are tempted to accumulate as much as possible in this life. Because I think we all have aspirations of of saving up as much as we can, being a part of that that 1% or 2%, and maybe some of us will have the blessing of, of being that wealthy someday. But we all know that if we have God... We're more wealthy than than any of those people who don't have God because he provides for us. And in the end, it really doesn't matter how much we save up, how much is in our account the day that we go and see our Savior because if we have our Savior, that's all that matters because he provides for everything that we need. Question five. What promises does God give us in 2 Corinthians 9? And how do these promises lead us to generosity? Let's take a look at what Paul has to say to the Corinthians. He says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. 
Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. So we see what Paul says to the Corinthians here. How does this promise lead us to generosity though? What do you think? Well, God promises to give us all we need so that we can keep on being generous. He will richly bless us when we are generous. So we see that you look at it as it's just a cycle. We give to the church generously. God blesses us generously. And then we give that back to the church out of thanks. And then God gives us gifts back again. It just keeps going and going and going. It's like the Energizer Bunny. It never stops. And that's what God does for us. And and Paul says God loves a cheerful giver and God is able to bless you abundantly. And he does so that in all things, at all times, even during times that we struggle with a pandemic in our world when we think that things might be a little hopeless, we think that we might be in need, God provides during those times. And because of that, because of his mercy and grace and because of our thankfulness and love to him, we will abound in every good work. So in question six here is kind of a three-parter. We're going to be looking at some agree-disagree questions. We got three of them. So, so here's the first one. Jesus is teach, agree or disagree, Jesus is teaching us that wealthy people like us aren't giving much unless we follow the widow's example and give all that we have. Would you agree or disagree with that? I think we can safely disagree with this. With this. Uh, the Lord encourages us to use our income to care for our family and to pay taxes and to help needy people like the widow. I mean, Jesus tells us, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. It's imp- I mean, we have to pay our taxes. We have to pay on loans that we might have. We need to care for our family. We need to put food on the table. We need to be able to buy clothes to wear. And it's also important to give back to people who are in need. However, her example does spur us to generosity and makes us ask, does my giving reflect the same love and trust in God as the widow's? And that's something that I can't sit here and and tell you to do. That's something that you yourself maybe just can sit back and reflect and just think, am I giving all that I can give or could I be doing more to, to show my love and thanks to God and to help spread his kingdom here on this earth. Agree or disagree? Based on this story, the church should not call attention to especially large contributions. And this question is kind of based on what Jesus did. Jesus just looked at what the people were giving when they were giving large amounts, but Jesus called out to his disciples only those, only the widow who gave the small gifts. So what do you think? Agree or disagree? The church should not call attention to especially large contributions. This is kind of, you can maybe agree, maybe disagree with this, but regardless, the church needs to be careful about singling out large gifts. And here's why. Uh, Reports of such gifts can indeed be an encouragement to others whom the Lord has blessed with the ability to do likewise. However, This account makes it clear that a gift can be large, not because of its size, but rather because of what it says about the size of a giver's heart. And that's what it boils down to is the attitude of the heart. If someone gives tens of thousands of dollars and says, I want to help out with this new building project at your church or whatever it may be, then what are they looking for? Are they just giving it cheerfully because they want to see God's kingdom grow literally, physically grow, 
Or are they doing it just so they can put their name on a plaque on a wall and say, look what I did. I gave this money to build this portion of our sanctuary. So really, it's all about the giver's heart. And that's why we need to kind of tread those waters carefully when it comes to calling attention to those large contributions. And I think if, if any believer in their heart gives out of, out of faith and out of love and thanks to their Savior, they'll more than likely remain anonymous, just saying, I'm giving this for the Lord's work. It, it has nothing to do with me, but it's all about, all about God. Agree or disagree, the amount of our giving in relation to our income reflects upon our faith. What do you think? Agree or disagree? I think in general we can agree with this. It's true. A person who trusts in God will give more generously than one who does not. If you're so worried about earthly things that you think, I can't put a single dime in this week because what if I need that dime next week for for food? Then you're not going to be a very cheerful giver because where's your faith? Your faith is in your possessions. Your faith is in your money. But if we put our faith in God, we, we are more cheerfully able to give and put all we can and give it back to God. Question seven. How does Jesus impoverish himself by coming, how did Jesus impoverish himself by coming to this world? And then how did he give all he had three days after this account? So remember in the, in the brief introduction I spoke of, this is the Tuesday of Holy Week to bring us back into perspective here. And as of recording this video, we are uh, a week out from from Maundy Thursday. So we're, we're getting to that point literally in our lives as well. So think about these questions. Jesus hu- humbled himself. We talk about his steps of humiliation. He left the power and glory of heaven to become mere human and our servant. So he was, we talk about the steps being he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, step one, born of the Virgin Mary, two, he was suffered under Pontius Pilate, three, crucified, four, died, five, and then was buried, six. So we talk about those being his steps of humiliation. That's how he impoverished himself. That's how he humbled himself. And then at the, the time of the writing of this story in Mark, He offered his very life for us three days later. He gave his very life. He became sin for us. And he did that because of his love for us. Question eight. How does Jesus give us both the why and the how of giving? First, we'll take a look at the why. Jesus gave us, gave his all for us and made us mem- members of God's kingdom. Gratitude and love for him is why we give. When we look at it, Jesus gave us all he had, more than he had to. God didn't have to send Jesus down to save us. He could have just snapped his fingers and said, there, all, all your sins are gone. No, he He gave his one and only son, literally his everything for us. And Jesus gave up everything about himself that made himself God. He he didn't make full and frequent use of his divine powers so that he could become obedient to death on a cross. And seeing that sacrifice, seeing that love, encourages us to give too. And in our hearts and through our faith, that's why we give. Now let's take a look at the how Jesus gives us the how of giving by showing us that true love is willing to give generously and unselfishly without counting the cost. When Jesus suffered and died on the cross for our sins, it wasn't as if it was a loan. That's saying, hey, I did this for you. Okay, that's done, but you owe me this in return. You have to do so many of the good things. You have to give me so much money before you come to heaven and then you'll be fine. No, it was without cost. It was all because he did it generously and unselfishly, not thinking about himself, 
but he was thinking about the souls that he was going to save. Question nine. Look a month into the future. What do you see? A poor woman who has just died of starvation being led out to her grave or a woman sitting at her table thanking God for another miracle. So what do you think? What do you think would be the case for that woman that we read about in Mark? And what do you think about yourself in your life today? When you give a generous amount to the church, where do you think you'll be a month from now? Will you be, like the question says, just dying of starvation? Or will you be sitting at your kitchen table thanking God for another miracle? And there's not really a, g- a good answer here, so think about it for yourself. What do, what do you see? This is a good way to end the lesson, and it gives us a chance to pause and think about our futures as cheerful and generous givers. So maybe think about that as we, as we proceed into Holy Week What does it mean for you? What does Jesus' sacrifice mean for you? And what does that lead your heart to do? So I encourage you to to think about that throughout next week. Just to summarize the lesson here, God is the ultimate giver. He gives us life and everything we have in life. He gives us love and forgiveness and eternal life through his son. Our giving to the Lord does not prompt God to give to us, but rather is an expression of thanks to God for his gifts. Our giving, like that of the poor widow, reflects our trust that God will continue to give us all we need. And we'll close our lesson today with prayer. Lord, help us remember how blessed we are and how secure our lives and futures are in you. Enable us to serve you willingly and wholeheartedly in all we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Once again, if you have any questions or comments, please put them below the video here. And if you feel so inclined, please give us a share on Facebook with friends and family so more people can be staying connected to Jesus and staying in God's word. And if at any point you want to uh, share this as well, just on YouTube. If you, if you have an account, just to, to like our page and to follow us so you can get notifications about when these videos are coming out. We try to get them out every Saturday around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. But you can also check out all of our worship services there. And we also encourage you with those worship services to, to share them with, with friends and family on Facebook or, or somewhere else so that people can keep staying in tune with God's word, especially during this difficult time in our lives. On that note, God's blessings on the rest of your week.